Hi, my name is Omar Latif uh, on behalf of the Coordinating Committee of the Greater Toronto Workers Assembly. Welcome to you and welcome to Hassan Husseini, our chief uh, speaker today, and of course, Herman also. The Greater Toronto Workers Assembly, most of you know it, uh, came into formal existence about four years ago, uh, October of 2009. And uh, it, it was an attempt, it is an attempt to get together the left to have a common debating space, to be able to do things together. And so, we have uh, almost all Marxist tendencies, uh, people within our uh, gathering, uh, the socialists, uh, Trotskyists, anarchists, Maoists, communists. And so we hope that uh, there will be enough things that uh, we can work on together to be able to uh, have uh, an effective fight back in the city of Toronto against neoliberalism and against capitalism in general. So uh, today's uh, meeting, uh, when as soon as we heard that uh, Hassan was uh, running, we asked him to come here. Uh, somebody was asking me, why did you not ask the other speakers? Look, Ken Giorgetti wouldn't have come here too small for him. <laughs> and uh, Ken uh, is uh, running on his uh, track record. We all know his track record, so it would have been superfluous to have him here. And perhaps uh, Herman could cast uh, a bit of light on the CLC in the past 15, 15 years. Uh, why not the other Hassan? Uh, we, when we asked Hassan, the other Hassan was not in the race, uh, Yusuf. And then, uh, when, when this was all gelled together, we thought it would be very disrespectful. And we didn't want to set up a sort of talk right here either. Uh, and maybe Hassan Yusuf is very, very busy, so he, we didn't ask, think of asking him uh, to come. Uh, Hassan Husseini, you know him, you read the bio, he's been a social activist, he's been a trade union activist, and it was a very, very courageous thing of him to do, to challenge Giorgetti uh, in, in the presence of a monolithic, uh, you know, decision by the Labour Council, but by the Labour Central, not to challenge him. So, you know, this was very brave of him. One other personal note of bravery, you all remember, or most of you might remember, 2001, when the, uh, the so-called riot in front of the Queen's Park took place. So he was there, and everybody told him uh, to keep your nose clean, don't get into things, and he said he would. Uh, two days later, he was arrested by the police, and when his ex-wife heard about it, uh, that he needed bail, he said, throw the key away, because I told him not to do things. <laughs> he was charged with uh, throwing uh, uh, a stone at the, the police, one of the charges was. And so, in defense, we wanted to get somebody who was uh, an expert in biomechanics and throw brains <laughs> and throw forces, and the man, mad, madly enough, was going to testify that he wasn't actually throwing the stone, he was catching the stone. <laughs> <laughs> And then it was on the story for the softball. <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, Hassan. One of the key problems facing us as Canadians, as uh, Canadian workers, is that the official rate of unemployment is 6.9%. That's 1.3 million Canadians. It's, of course, much higher for Native Canadians, or Black Canadians, or other minorities. But 1.3 million, if that wasn't enough, there is another way to look at it. There's 19 million Canadians of uh, work age. And when you look at how many are employed, it's only 61%. It's only 61%. Because unemployment is that they phone you or they call you and say, like, I haven't been collecting EI. And if you say no, they say, the hell with you, you're not unemployed. Six million Canadians officially are not employed right now. That's one of the key questions that is facing the CLC, I think, and us in the lab. So without further ado, I'll ask Herman to do this. Okay, I'll try to be as brief as I can. You didn't come to hear me, most of you. I know just about everybody here. You've heard me a thousand times, and I've heard you, so. Just <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not taking this credit, but I'm the president of the CLC. Just a, just a background there to, uh, where a lot of the socialist left is around the CLC. We know what it, it is technically. It's the central labor body 
Uh, it's got 3.2 million members and has some of the strongest and best labor-oriented researchers and staff there. And uh, um, it uh, supposedly has a, it's supposed to be the voice of the Canadian working class, at least the organized labor movement, on key policy issues at the federal level. It has verbally and legally, at least on, on paper, challenged a number of important right-wing initiatives by the Tories over the years about postal delivery, public pensions, unemployment, the Tory private members' bills, etc. Uh, and it gives resources in different places to, uh, to some of the important social movements, I don't know more, Occupy, that sort of thing. And uh, it has given resources to these organizations and at least has given some kind of verbal support to it. And it, it, the Labor Councils actually are to, aren't part of the, uh, the provincial federations, actually, they're directly tied to the Canadian Labor Conference. So there's this tie there. It regulates relations between the affiliates, which are often fractious, and one of the few, I think one of the, the more positive things about the CLC is that the relationship between Quebec and the rest of uh, Canada is embodied in those structures. Sort of this is what sovereignty association might look like. That being said, of course, as we know, when you get beyond the formal roles, when it comes to the positions it takes on political and international issues, when you look at what it actually does, it's, it's a very disappointing sort of a kind of a cipher for what a labor central could and should be. The current president who's been there for 15 years is, is a big part of the problem, but the problems go deeper and are part of the political and structural DNA of the CLC and the unions that make up, that make up uh, its affiliates. Uh, its member affiliates and the entire Canadian labor movement, not to mention the larger, larger political environment, environment within the working class in Canada, is under stress, as we all know, and it's the response to that stress which is really critical for all of us. It's been over 21 years, so I don't know if you all remember, but some of you wouldn't be around, but that since the CLC organized a massive jobs demonstration in Ottawa, they, in the last days of, of the Tories, that contributed to the end of the Mulroney Campbell Tory government. Bob White was the CLC president, and he came from the union that I came from, the CW. We all had big hopes of Bob, but, uh, but he, even he was really unable to make that organization relevant after that, 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 that demonstration and, uh, and, uh, and mobilize working class interests in the country. There have been no real campaigns mobilizing, educating, inspiring Canadian union members uh, that have come from the CLC, although it tends to take a progressive stance. If you look at the critical moments that we've looked at since, since uh, George Eddy's been there, NAFTA, the anti-globalization era, plant closures, the return of concessions, because there was a, a spate of concessions in the private sector in the, in the, in the 1980s, in the early, late 70s and early 80s, that was fought off. But when the return of concessions came back, they were, they were not challenged. The Afghanistan war, uh, the Canadian aggression in Afghanistan, the response to the Great Recession, key collective bargaining struggles, su such as the Thali Inco strike, uh, the Caterpillar, uh, it's not really a cup of bargaining struggle, but the Caterpillar closure. Uh, you didn't hear about the CLC and the larger labor movement. And even issues such as pension reform, where the CLC, as it had in a lot of key issues, had strong paper positions and had few show, a few short demonstrations early and then disappeared behind the scenes to either lobby and make compromises in the hope that the Tories and the CLC's political partners in the NDP would make an acceptable compromise or basically it just died. In fact, you have to look around with a magnifying glass to see it happening there. Although, the folk, although George Eddy and his allies, they, 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 they correct about this great figure they had around this. I'm waiting for the victory. We all are. I was in France in 1996, right after the huge demonstrations against attacks on pensions, and I saw something, something a lot different. The CLC took, took, continues to take positive positions on pensions, but we don't really hear much. And similarly so with things like health care cuts, uh, EI, um, there's no real job strategy that relies on other than partnership with private capital. Um, there's nothing about taking on the banks, nationalizing them, or doing something different with them, even though the CLC has a really wonderful, a long-term term, um, position about uh, developing a, a national uh, financial investment vehicle by taxing financial institutions, including large pension funds. But that's gone nowhere, like most of this stuff. And each of these struggles I mentioned before, Caterpillar, Valley, and Hill, could have been a centerpiece of a larger labor movement uh, struggle, an alliance with social movements. It could have galvanized, it could have built something bigger, and it could have challenged the what's now, or really a corporatism, right? The term corporatism 
you know, when the younger folks use the term corporate, it means to do with corporate, corporations taking over. But it also traditionally it refers to the idea that you know you'll solve problems by uh, unions, federal government, and governments and private companies coming to some happy mediums in terms of a kind of a partnership uh, approach. The CLC has become a kind of an afterthought, never part of any serious consideration for building a labor or a larger working class movement, uh, and perhaps a source of funding, but never really a source of organization or inspiration, and that's a tragedy. Its politics uh, reflect a lot of the contradictions of the affiliates, but in particular it is a spin, which is particularly horrifying. Aside from the strong paper positions in defense of union and worker rights, its approach to politics is mired in a combination of partnership with existing governments, less so with the Tories because of who they are, but it's still their basic stance. It's not as if labor bought labor movement doesn't have to have a relationship with ongoing relationship with existing governments. We know they have to, but uh, when it's your fundamental strategy, it's a problem. And the continued identification with social democracy as an ideology, in the sense that you know you have to make really have relationships with electoral parties, uh, and the traditional relationship with the NDP is fraught with contradictions, as it should be. But they, they're really mired in a similar kind of approach to how you make change. It's a dead end political approach, an ideological approach, which in turn is tied to a party that, at least now, can never really challenge the domination of private markets, private accumulation, or neoliberalism. Uh, its slavish devotion to electoral uh, ties to the NDP, even when it's crystal clear that when the latter proposes continued dependence on private investment, tar sands extraction and export, so-called trade agreements, and uh, a phobia against taxes, then th that relationship has to be a different kind of relationship. And, and I remember over the years, there was a, there was a people that I worked with at the CAW who uh, worked with, I was going to say absconded, but they weren't there. <laughs> That's the wrong word. They went to the CLC, and they were talking about these these, uh, um, these uh, electoral things they had for kids. They were like scratch and win things, and they asked really stupid, you know, uh, dumb questions, and you scratch and you get the right answer. They saw this as the kind of political education they were doing for people. I, I felt really embarrassed. This is a person who's a really good person. I'm thinking, my God, this is what they're doing. Um, and now the NDP here in Ontario has really moved far to the right in a lot of ways in opposing taxes for, for collective forms of consumption. The CLC is leaning on provincial federations who are starting to reflect uh, some kind of contradictory relationship with this kind of a thing, trying to look for some space to how you relate um, um, the uh, uh, a need for an independent position, political position of the labor movement, and its relate, particularly its relationship to um, uh, the NDP. And when labor movements around the world are really trying to deal with this relationship, you know, they're not exactly breaking, breaking away from social democracy in droves, but they realize the contradiction. They're trying to handle those contradictions by debating, discussing in, in Britain and, in, 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 uh, and across Europe. We don't hear that here at all. There were times when there were debates about the labor movement's relationship to the NDP, but they were quickly stopped because they were seen as divisive amongst the uh, affiliates. And frankly, there's been nothing for that. I remember that since I was there for about eight year, eight to ten years about taking on these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of debates and discussions. The answers obviously are not simple. Um, they're, 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 they don't go the way that I particularly want them to go, but they need to, be, they need to happen. Uh, they haven't happened. I think the fundamentally, though, is a refusal to accept the reality that within capitalism, the earlier alliances or forms of partnerships with employers that were possible in the post-war period uh, stopped being possible by the late 1970s and now. And capitalism has changed. And it doesn't mean it's gotten better. It doesn't mean it's gotten worse. But the, the, the political space to be able to do these kinds of things is closed. And the leaders of the CLC and its affiliates, particularly the present administration, have not drawn the right conclusions. On things like the environment, it participates and helps to provide funds for a number of interesting networks and, uh, and, 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 uh, and experiments. But it always tends to remain limited by market-based regulatory solutions, popular in the social democratic universe, things like carbon taxes, which is not wrong in itself, and forms of cap and trade, which are in fact forms of derivative markets. In the international sphere, it used to be the CLC for the longest time, as we all remember, those are folks that are approaching my age here. Um, it used to be a vehicle for Cold War imperialism of the worst order here. It doesn't now. More recently, it broke from this mold, 
but remains locked into the American and EU-oriented acceptance of the logic of globalization, but with a heart, sort of like the kind of critique that Stiglitz and those folks made. It was notoriously silent during the Afghan war and the imposition of thought shock therapy in Eastern Europe that I remember when I was in Russia in 1994 having a debate with a friend of mine who was working for the CLC and I was shocked by the position that they were taking. Uh, it hasn't become a friend of the Latin American challenge to neoliberalism in Venezuela, Ecuador, and elsewhere. And it really hasn't done that much around, as I mentioned before, the building the kind of alliances you need to take on the valet and coast and that sort of thing. Even though a lot of the affiliates, the affiliates that are not necessarily associated with the left, like the steel workers, were doing amazing work around this and trying to build this kind of a thing. Um, the CLC is a loose federation of affiliates, but those affiliates themselves reflect major political and organizational differences, and while being mostly infected with similar weaknesses from the CLC itself. From the center left, you have QP, Unifor, CUPW, to the center, the steel workers and that sort of thing, further to the right, to the harder right of other, other kinds of uh, organizations. The private sector has been defeated for the most part. The public sector remains mostly concerned with members' immediate outcomes and not part of a larger class orientation, which it needs to do, and all except the more of a corporatist orientation of how you make change. That is, it's got to be in some kind of partnership with private capital. Um, I think that I just want to outline a couple of points that I think need to be part of any kind of approach to change. One is that unions in the CLC have to advocate for the class as a whole. And in different unions and sectors, that means different things to emphasize, but it means not just looking after the immediate interests of the collective bargaining interests of, in the private or public sector, but how do you transform those sectors to work for the working class as a whole, and how do you do this in ways that uh, involve the rest of the working class so they can have a say over it. Uh, they need to break with the dependence on the NDP. It doesn't mean that, that, that there's, we should be voting for liberals and conservatives. But the union movement has to develop its own politics based upon uh, uh, a radical analysis of what it needs to do. And you organize people around those demands, and then you, you develop your, your electoral strategy in, in that kind of a context around things like the environmental justice, housing and basic, basic incomes, public transit, moving away from public based, from employer based pensions to universal pensions. And larger issues like nationalizing the banks, moving away from fossil fuel economy, uh, health care, rights of First Nations, a series of things which we all know are in the situation. So what do we do around this, and how does this fit in? Fit in? Obviously, running to challenge the, the orthodoxy in, in, the, in, in the Canadian Labor Congress, or in every, any level, is important. It carves out a space, it gives people, people an orientation, a, a reference point for an orientation, and allows you to build, because the CLC is like out, of all of the, the labor organizations, is, is, a, is a kind of a uh, superstructure on top of a superstructure, <laughs> in the sense that uh, it, it's, it's there, but it's not all there. And you need to organize for con converting things by playing some kind of a role there. You need left caucuses and groupings inside locals, affiliates, feds, and the CLC, working to reorient and transform unions and larger movements. And you need a movement of socialists and anti-capitalists outside and inside to be able to bring some kind of political, I think, sanity to this kind of thing. Um, and you need projects, to people to be able to work around. And I will stop there because this is a project that's going to be happening here. Thank you. I just wanted to ask Carol Wall, who had challenged orthodoxy herself, to introduce uh, Hassan uh, more fully than we uh, have uh, done so. Okay, so my name is Carol Wall and I actually ran for the CLC presidency in 2005. And I want to be clear, I ran not against something, I ran for something. So I want to be clear about that. And it wasn't about me, it was about changing the movement because at that particular time, I saw and sort of predicted what's happening now, which is, is basically the death of the movement. And coming from a working class family, I couldn't have that happen. I had to do whatever I had to do. And so against all odds, I did a grassroots campaign, um, as crazy as people thought, and I, and I ran, and there was bets that I wouldn't get you know, more than 5% of the vote, and being prevented from caucuses and being prevented from a lot of things and a lot of the games that are played, I got 38% of the vote, which I'm quite proud of. So you can imagine.
imagine my excitement when Brother Hassan kick-started this thing again, because when I ran, people afterwards were disappointed because they thought I would do it again. And that wasn't my purpose. My purpose was to try to get a dialogue going. So how many of you are going to the CLC convention? Okay, so this is crucial. This is important. I think the labor movement's at a crossroads. There is incredible people within the movement and they deserve better than what they're getting right now. They deserve a lot better. It's, you know, grassroots, rank and file members, your dues pay the freight. And you deserve a lot better because you're up against incredible odds here with the neoliberal agenda, Harper, Hudak, you name it. It, we're, it, we're up against it. So it's really crucial that you not only go to that CLC convention and that you make sure that your voices are heard, you make sure that there is, a, ask for a debate. I mean, I wanted a debate and that was like, I, you would have thought I had 10 heads. What a debate? <laughs> Actually, say what your platform is and, and answer, I, I'm fine with that, but that didn't happen. Um, as far as the, the, the voting, uh, it's supposed to be a secret ballot vote. Did that happen? No, because people needed to be controlled and watched and told how to vote. And we're not, you're not going to be able to fight the forces if you're going to allow yourself to be controlled and told what to do. You build this movement from the bottom up and make sure the leadership is reflected, not the top down. I, I applaud Hassan for doing this. I'm excited that now there's an election. Imagine, no more coronations. Because one of the things that I was also told by a labor leader is we didn't choose you. And I said, I'm very proud of that. Thank you. <laughs> so you know what? Don't let them choose you. You can step forward. This movement belongs to all of us. It doesn't belong to a handful of people. It's time. This is the time. It, people weren't ready in 2005. They're ready now. They're ready now, and there will be a united, progressive forces going to the CLC, and you need to make sure that you know which side that you're on. Which side are you on? The Harper government has thrown up trial balloons, and to my mother, who's 88 years old, disappointment, the labor movement wasn't on, on the ground. And she said to me, well, what's happening here? What's going on here? Because I come from a working class family where when I was at the Toronto Star and we were on a picket line, my parents came down to the picket line. And then they saw us waiting a few minutes and letting trucks go in. And they said, Carol, what's, what, what's happening here? And I said, well, no, no, this is the protocol that we worked out with the police. And, you know, we wait a few minutes, they have to wait, and then they go in and said, but, but there's a strike. And I said, no, no, yeah, there's a strike, but we have this protocol. And my father looked at me and he said, no wonder the labor movement's in a mess and they left the picket line, right? And so we, honestly, like this is crucial and you need to, if you're, those of you who are going to the CLC, you need to talk to all your fellow rank and file, especially the first time delegates, and make sure they understand what's at stake here. And for those who you, you are not going and you know someone going, you need to talk to them and make sure they know what's at stake. It's your movement. Take it back. Take it back. <laughs>